holy name. I'm going to ask you to turn with me tonight. Thank you for being here. Let me just simply say that this Tuesday night. We've had uh, good services, uh, good spirit in this church. I really mean that. Uh, if there's a freedom in this place. That's probably one reason I preach as long as I do. Uh, so uh, some of that is going to be placed on blame on you. You're so good. Hearing with faith. The Bible tells us that the message of God when it's preached uh, can be mixed with faith or should be mixed with faith in those that hear it. And that's been the case this week. I've enjoyed preaching here at Unity Baptist Church. Tonight I want to call your attention uh, to the Gospel according to Mark, uh, chapter 5. And uh, just a bit of, bit of trivia as you turn there to Mark chapter 5. If you were asked where would one find our Lord's first missionary effort as a man here, uh, you'd have to say right here in this text, Mark chapter 5 is where we see our Lord first making missionary effort to the Gentiles, to the Gentiles in Mark chapter 5. It's a familiar passage to many of us who have been Christians for any time. And it's about the maniac of Gadara there. And um, the Bible tells us that Jesus uh, and his disciples came over to the other side of the sea into the country of the Gadarenes. Verse 1, And when he was come out of the ship, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit, who had his dwelling among the tombs. And no man could bind him, no, not with chains. Because that he had been often bound with fetters and chains, and the chains had been plucked asunder by him. And the fetters broken in pieces, neither could any man tame him. And always, night and day, he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying and cutting himself with stones. But when he saw Jesus afar off, he ran and worshipped him. And cried with a loud voice and said, What? Have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of the Most High God? I adjure thee by God that thou torment me not. For he said unto him, Come out of the man, thou unclean spirit. And he asked him, What is thy name? And he answered, saying, My name is Legion, for we are many. And he besought him much that he would not send them away out of the country. Now there was there nigh under the mountains a great herd of swine feeding, and all the devils besought him, saying, Send us into the swine, that we may enter into them. And forthwith Jesus gave them leave. And the unclean spirits went out and entered into the swine, and the herd ran violently down a steep place into the sea. There were about two thousand and were choked in the sea. And they that fed the swine fled and told it in the city and in the country. And they went out to see what it was that was done. And they come to Jesus and see him that was possessed with the devil and had the legion sitting and clothed and in his right mind. And get this. And they were afraid. They find this man, once possessed with the devil, sitting beside Jesus, got his clothes on, he's in his right mind, and the Bible says, the Holy Spirit of God says, and those people were afraid. And they that saw it told them how it befell to him that was possessed with the devil. And also told him concerning the swine. That'd be a story to tell, wouldn't it? And they began to pray him to depart out of their coasts. Now I just read those 17 verses for the express purpose of setting the context. Here's a man who dwelt among the dead. Typical of a lot of men you and I walk by today. A lot of women, you and I, walk by today, have their dwellings among the tombs, living in darkness, bound by the devil himself. You and I need to live our lives as God's children with this understanding. Every single human being on the face of this planet today is lost if they do not know Jesus Christ as Lord 
and Savior. D.L. Moody once said that when he encountered anybody new on the street, the first thing that he saw when he saw that lady or he saw that gentleman was a great big L right on the forehead. Now we know his imagination put it there, but the Scripture and the Spirit confirmed it. Men who do not know Jesus Christ do not know God the Father. And they're lost, conceived in sin, born in sin, destined to a devil's hell. If the Lord Jesus Christ, by the power of the Spirit, does not open their hearts by faith to salvation, to the message, Harold said, of the cross, of the blood of Jesus Christ. I want to suggest to you today that there's much talk in the Southern Baptist Convention. There's many books in evangelical Christianity that have to do with evangelism. I am so glad for so many programs that have, listened to me, resulted in so many, even hundreds of thousands of conversions. Years ago, I believe it was CWT. Am I correct? Christian Witness Training. When I came into the faith, Easter Sunday, 1988, CWT was kind of fading out and, and then something else was coming in. You remember what it was? E.E. <laughs> e. Now we had the Roman road. We had the four spiritual laws. Bill Bright and all of those wonderful t uh, tracks. Billy Graham Evangelistic Association put out many. And I thank God for every one. E.E. E. When you ask the couple two diagnostic questions. And now after that it was Faith. You'd go door to door and you had an outreach and a visitation program. And I am, don't misunderstand what I'm saying, I am all for anything that we can place before the body of Christ to encourage them and equip them to be soul winners for the glory of God. Uh, the Bible tells Psalm 126 verse 6 that he that winneth souls is wise. The Bible also tells us that he that goeth forth and weepeth, bearing precious seed, shall doubtless come again rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. I am grateful that Acts 1.8 tells us, and you shall be. Not that you might be, or, or you should be. The Bible says, in fact, if you're a Christian, Jesus said, you shall be my witnesses. Where? Jerusalem, right where you live. Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost part of the world. I believe with all of my heart that the truest indication that a man, a woman, a boy or girl has been saved, listen to me, it's not foolproof, but the truest indication is the moment that they're saved, they're wanting to do what? <laughs> Answer please. They won't start telling somebody else what happened to them. I had a meeting with your pastor today and my brother Jack O'Neill here. He, 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 we, he just happened in. You know how God sometimes puts those happen meetings together. It was a sovereign providential meeting. And as we were sitting there talking, uh, it, it just hit me. I, I would much rather point somebody in a direction than to try to arrange or orchestrate or manipulate or impress or influence somebody to share their faith. I would much rather say, you've got the desire, go here or, or go there. Once I got saved Easter Sunday 1988, let me tell you what happened to me. That Sunday morning, my brother, about nine months earlier, I got off work one day and uh, my brother, I said, what are you going to do tonight? He said, I'm just going to go home and hang around. My brother had spent about two and a half years when he was a teenager, 17 to 19 and a half. Uh, my brother was caught up in a bad situation in a card game and a man took out a warrant. And there were five guys involved. My brother had took the fall. And later he told me, he said, David, I took the man's money. It's $32. Well, he went to prison for that. My brother Danny did. Spent two and a half years, and rightly so. He stole the man's money, lied about it a while, and then just did his time, realized, you know, I might as well own up to this. I'm in a man's place. I need to take the man's responsibility. I did it. And the man, my mother, just like, the, ooh, he just about killed her. 
But I told my mom, the chances are pretty high that he was involved in that group and he, he knew something about it. If he didn't take it, he knew who did. But I said, that's a hard lesson to learn, but he learned it. Well, he got out and he did okay for a while. Then he went crazy a while and I gave him a job. And one day I asked him, I said, what are you going to do tonight? He said, I don't know. I'm just going to go home and watch TV. It's on a Tuesday night. And I thought, well, I'll see you in the morning. Pick you up about 7.15. He said, okay. Well, the next morning, I go by his house and he wasn't there. And I thought, uh-oh. So I called around, see if anybody knew us, four cell phones. And I said, we hadn't seen him. And so I pulled up to the job. I had three other guys on this great big church, the First United Methodist Church of Gastonia. We were working on the steeple. And all of a sudden, when I pulled up, I saw these three guys just standing around. The crane was running. And I thought to myself, man, why aren't you guys up there on that steeple? That thing's costing me about $110 an hour and nothing's being done. What's the deal? He said, well, you need to go ask your brother. I said, my brother? He said, yeah. I said, he wasn't at home. He said, no. He said, when we got here this morning, he was already here. So I went around. I said, where's he at? He said, he's around the side. And I went around that great big old church, and I was lost. I was not at that particular time in my life. Uh, I'd already asked God to help me, even as a lost man, not to drink anymore. And he took it to God be the glory. But I let it alone. I was okay. I, I wasn't drinking. I walked around there, and here's my brother. Tattoos on his arm, big old thick beard sitting there. And when he looked up at me, it looked like somebody had hit him with both fists in his eyeballs. His eyes were swollen shut. He was red in the face. And I thought who, to myself, who in the world got a hold of him? I thought he was going to go home and just watch TV. So I said, what in the world is wrong with you? And he was crying. I've never seen my brother cry in years. And he looked up at me and he said, I got saved last night. And this morning I got up real early and I just walked here. I said, you did what? He said, at five o'clock I couldn't sleep and I was dressed and I just walked here. I said, you mean to tell me you've been here since 5.30 this morning? He said, 5.30 this morning, sitting on the steps, just looking up at the cross. I got saved. And I said, you got saved? He said, I said, how did that happen? He said, you know, Rusty Dennis has been after us the whole time to go to church. I said, yeah. He says, he's been after me. His Volkswagen come to the house every night. I said, I'm going. You want to go? Jump in. He said, well, if I want to go, I'll drive my truck there. He said, yeah, you better come. He said, I've been praying for you. God ain't going to take you off my heart. I'll see you later. And he drove off. And he says, after he drove off, it just hit me. I, I could go. It ain't going to hurt nothing. And he went and God saved him. It was nine months later when I went to church in April of 1988. But in Christmas of 1987, I came home one day. My brother had been living for the Lord for about a year now. Uh, nine months or so, whatever it was. And I, I walked into my house. He had a dentist appointment at 1 o'clock. He said, I don't think I'm coming back. They're going to do some work. I'll just take the day off. I said, fine, I'll be quitting early anyway. Time I got home, I walk into my kitchen, and there's my wife in her apron. The, the, the kitchen has pans and shortening and eggs and bowls and cake mixes and pie dishes. And there's my brother standing right beside her, and he had his apron on too. And he had stuff on his hand. He just grinning at me just for just grinning. And I said, what in the world is going on? She said, he'll have to tell you. They were baking cakes and pies for the Lottie Moon Christmas offering. And so he looks at me. I said, what's going on? He said, you ever heard of Lottie Moon? And I said, never have. He said, she was a missionary to China, born to parents in Virginia, parents that had some means. They were going to send her off to college. Her life was pretty much set, the life course. But she told her parents that God had saved her and called her to be a minister to the nations and a missionary, particularly to the people of China. She'd already gotten her ticket and she's heading to China and she gave her life so that the Chinese people could come to faith in Jesus Christ. She got so sick and did without food herself so people could eat and on her way to England to get medical assistance, help, she died. My brother looked at me and had tears in his eyes. And I said, oh, well. So I put down my briefcase and I went all the way to the bathroom. And I looked at myself in the mirror and I thought, what in the world is going on here? That was in October of 1987, April of 1988. I walk into the West Cramerton Baptist Church. Married seven years, never, ever been to church, not one time with my bride of seven years.
I walked into that church door like I walked in here tonight. The place was filled, maybe 450 people at the West Cramden Baptist Church. It was Easter. I was among the Easter crowd. And a little lady about that tall who had hair about that tall, she walked right up to me with a pretty smile on her face and her eyes were just glistening. And she smiled and she stuck her little bony 74-year-old hand out and she said, good morning. I said, good morning. How are you? My wife took off. I was alone, just me and this stranger. I was so afraid. And I said, how are you? She said, I'm fine. I said, good. She said, you sure picked a good day to come to God's house. I said, yes, ma'am, I did. She said, he's alive. Now, I knew who she was talking about here. And I said, yes, ma'am, he is. And then she looked at me and she said, your name is David. I'd never been to that church, not once. And I said, yes, ma'am, it is. And I started to say I didn't, but I had this thought, is your name Jean Dixon? I mean, I thought maybe that she was, you know, some kind of, and I didn't say that, I thought it. And she said, I said, it is, how do you know that? And she said, look over there. And the people were greeting one another, and she looked over there, and I looked over there, and she said, you see that man smiling at me, looking at us? I said, yeah, the bald-headed man. And I said, yes, ma'am, I see him. She said, that's my husband, Ray Tig. We've been married over 50 years. And every single day for seven months at our breakfast table, we prayed for you by name. Now, when she told me that, I just about went, I, I just, I'm, I'm telling you, all my strength just left me. I thought, my gosh, how does she know? And then she said this, Cody, she said, I knew you'd come. And she let my hand go and walked away. That preacher, that choir sang, that preacher prayed, that preacher preached. I was sitting four rows back about where you are. And when the invitation was given, I jumped over my wife, my sister-in-law, and my brother. And I laid down right there in that carpet, first one. And I left a spot on that carpet from tears and things that come out of your nose. I was just broken. And I stood up different than I went down. I've never been the same. Now, I didn't know what God was going to make a preacher out of me. I had no clue. But I read the book of Jeremiah some months later. And the Bible clearly says that God called him to do what he was doing even while he was in his mother's womb. Now, you hear me tonight. I'm going to read to you just a few more verses from this story in Mark 5. And, and, and I'm telling you what God's done with me. is He's convinced me that we have complicated evangelism. For many Christians in the Southern Baptist Church, and I'm most familiar with the Southern Baptist. I was saved in the Southern Baptist Church. Thank God Almighty, the Spirit of God got a hold of me before the Southern Baptist Convention did. But I can tell you right now, I do believe that I am Southern Baptist by biblical conviction. Our missionary efforts and our desires to fund missionaries over there, second to none. Churches can split, disband, sell their property, and that man and woman, that family over there on that seas can still stay on the field doing Jesus' work. But I am convinced that when we look at this subject called evangelism, there's a better way than many ways. I want to speak to you on the subject evangelism, God's way. And I want you to look in verse 18, 19, and 20 of Mark 5. And when he was come into the ship, when Jesus was come into the ship, he that had been possessed with the devil prayed him that he might be with him. Howbeit Jesus suffered him not, but saith unto him, Go home to thy friends and tell them how great things the Lord hath done for thee and hath had compassion on thee. And he departed and began to publish in Decapolis how great things Jesus had done for him. And all men did marvel. Will you pray with me, Father? 
it is by grace through faith in Jesus that I'm saved. As varied are the men who occupy this earth, so varied are the methods that you have implemented for the salvation of your church. I will not demean any effort, method, that has resulted in your son's glory through the salvation of a sinful soul. I thank you, God, for Gideon Bibles placed in hotel rooms. For evangelistic tracts handed out, distributed on bathroom mirrors, urinals, even dropped on restaurant tables. I thank you that in my own life's experience, nine months before I went to that church, my brother stood up on a Wednesday night one time and mentioned my name in prayer. Ray and Rachel Tigg would later say to me that as they were praying a couple of months later, God impressed upon their heart Danny McCachran's brother David. They had written it on a bulletin. Ray went to find that bulletin and saw it. Yes, his name is David, Rachel. And every single morning for seven months, they prayed that I would come to faith in Jesus. Little did they know, they couldn't have, that in your sovereignty I would come to their church. And that first time there would be confronted and convicted and converted. And would confess my need of a Savior, of the Lord Jesus. And tonight as I stand here preaching, some 29 years later, I do so with an understanding that Rachel and Ray Teague are instrumental and even now are receiving reward from my ministry. I thank you, Father, that I am sure of several things as I preach this text. I am sure that you have placed your spirit in your church. I am sure that you have written on every believer's heart your word. I am sure that there's no plan B. That when we get to heaven, others will be there because of men who have labored in your word and in your work. No one sneaks in. No one gets in without the blood of Christ Jesus applied. And so, Father, tonight my only desire is to inspire the Spirit of God using me to inspire these that have gathered to hear what the Spirit of God, what thus saith the Lord, and the salvation of sinners may be the result. And I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to make to you, as quick as I can tonight, several observations as to what it means to do evangelism God's way. And I'm going to walk us through verses 18, 19, and 20. And I'm going to share with you seven insights that I saw in studying this seven. Don't let that scare you. You won't be here much longer than you were last night. Number one, evangelism God's way means no doubt. No doubt. I want you to look in verse 18. And when Jesus was come into the ship, listen, he that had been possessed with the devil prayed him that he might be with him. I want to call your attention first of all that evangelism God's way means there'll be no doubt in a child of God about his or her salvation. He that 
dead bend. You know enough English to understand what that means. That means what he once was, he now is not. He once was possessed with the devil. Not just depression, not just discouragement, not just a little bit of a down day. This man knew that he was hopeless and hopelessly headed for a grave that's dark with no hope other than that. And then all of a sudden he sees Jesus. How is it that a man possessed with a legion of demons can even in that possession see the one and only Son of God? The text says he did. The text affirms that when Jesus came onto the coast of Gadarene there, that this man, even possessed with the devil, had no doubt whatsoever who he was. What did he say? The Bible says that when Jesus came there and he saw Jesus afar off, look there in verse 6, this demon-possessed individual, listen, ran and worshipped him, cried out with a loud voice and said, What have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of the Most High God? I adjure thee by God that thou torment me not. So what you see in that story is the spiritual war that goes on in the lives of those that are held captive by death and depression and despair and yes, even demons. Do you believe that there are demons walking about us every day? If you believe there's a Holy Spirit, listen to me closely, you better well believe that there's an evil spirit. And you better well believe that the enemy himself has legion, demons, imps from hell going out and listening or living in the lives of people, possessing them. You know why a lot of lost people do what lost people do? Because they can't do nothing else. They don't have the power to overcome the grip of the devil. This man right here would still be lost today were it not for the sovereign providence of God. He would have still been there. He would have died destined to a devil's hell. You and I live among a lot of people, talk a lot, sing a lot, and write a lot, and uh, preach a lot about heaven, but you don't too, hear too many writing, singing, preaching about hell. There's a lot of books written about the Holy Spirit, but there's not too many bo books written about the evil spirits of hell, demons of alcohol, addiction, perversion, I'm saying to you right now, there was no doubt in this new believer's life that he was once lost, hopeless without Jesus. And now there's no doubt that he's now been, listen, accepted, born again, delivered by Jesus. And can I just simply say to you, that's my first observation, but it's most important. Do you know one thing that would help the church a lot in her evangelism to do it God's way is to have no doubt about whose you are and why you are whose you are. It would blow your mind if you knew how many people who would say to you quickly or to me, I know I'm saved, and I would ask them this quick, how do you know? They would not have a clue as to how they could biblically, listen, substantiate the claim that I'm a Christian. Do you know how most people will tell you that they know that they're a Christian? They'll tell you about the age they were and the prayer they prayed, but they couldn't give you any biblical basis whatsoever as to how they are biblically assured and spiritually secure in their salvation. Do you understand what justification really means? Some people would say it's as if you've never sinned. Let me tell you something. Justification requires that you know, in fact, that you did sin. Justification requires that you and I know, understand that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the Lamb of glory, took our sin on Calvary's cross. Living, He loved me. Dying, He saved me. Buried, He carried my sin far away. No doubt. Do you remember me telling to you? I think it was last night. Maybe it was Sunday night. I couldn't go to hell today if I wanted to. Some of you, when I said that, it just went, let me tell you something. I am my mama's child. And that brother I told you spent two and a half years in the pokey. 
Because he done something sinful, illegal, and got caught. Listen to me. He still was my mama's boy. And she would never, ever kick him. Even if she did, guess what? Nothing would change. Now, if that's true on the physical, temporal, earthly realm, how much more true is it is? My father lives in heaven. And though he has, listen, many sons and daughters, and he does not have a stepson or a stepdaughter, but he does have a favorite son. Now, if you and I have a favorite son, uh-oh. But he does. And it's right. It's holy. Because there's no son like the Son of God. There's no doubt that Jesus knew when he was on this earth that he was all man, but he never once, listen, had one day where he doubted whose son that he was. And that's a great encouragement to share Jesus. No doubt evangelism done God's way means there's no doubt in the child of God. Once lost and hopeless, now found and got hope, security, a future, a, a, a desire born of the Spirit of God. Don't you remember the story in John chapter 4, I mean chapter 9. You remember the story of the man born blind? And Jesus healed him. Then all of a sudden he goes and he wants to tell it. I, I once was blind, but now I see. And then they ask him. Those Pharisees ask him in John chapter 9, Who did this to you? I want you to know what he said. They said to him, let me get to John chapter 9. I'm in chapter 8. They said, uh, they called the man that was blind, verse 24, John 9. They said to him, give God the praise. We know that this man is a sinner. And he answered, talking about Jesus. They're trying to tell this message. And that man who was once blind, but now he sees, he answered and he said to them, whether he's a sinner or not, I don't know. But here's what I do know. One thing I do know, that whereas I was blind, now I see. No doubt. I'm going to tell you right now, when the devil comes against the child of God, that's one of the first things he uses. Did he not say to Eve, hath not God said, casting doubt on the revelation of Creator God? Number two, no doubt, but no delay. I love this. In verse 18 it says, he that had been... He that had been possessed with the devil prayed him that he might be with him. Isn't it amazing when you have no doubt what has happened in your life? There will be no delay in wanting to be and having this desire. Listen to me. Exercise. You want to be with Jesus. When I got saved Easter Sunday 1988, as I've said to you, we got out of church that particular Sunday. God be the glory about 10 to 1. I was out in the parking lot until about 1.15. All my, uh, two of my brothers came that Sunday. My, my wife, my two sister-in-laws, had a couple nieces and nephews there. And they just couldn't believe that Uncle David, Brother David, my husband David, my daddy David got saved. And it was just a new day. Do you know what I found out at about 3.30 that day? I found out that they don't meet on Sunday nights. And I was so let down that that Sunday, Easter Sunday, that the West Cranberry Baptist Church, because it's Easter, didn't have an evening service. Now listen to me. I'm a pastor now, and I've been in the church a while, and I understand why. We go to families, we have them make a great day, and we worship God by being with our families, our friends, and it does give people a great time, especially people who are on staff at churches, a great opportunity to spend the day, the evening, with family and worshiping God. But can I share this with you? <laughs> I'm going to. I was discouraged. Here's a guy that never been in church seven years of his marriage and all of a sudden I have no doubt that I've been saved, born again, the Spirit of God living in me. And I didn't know Matthew, Mark from Luke or John. I had a little New Testament I carried and he made Old Testament references so I just sit there and listen. That's four screens and the word on the screen. But I, I picked it up. He talked in Isaiah 53 and he talked about in Isaiah 7 and all these. And, but when he got back over there to John, I just opened it up. I had a Bible and I knew where John was in that New Testament. And all of a sudden, 
I'm discouraged at 3.30 that same day that they don't have an evening worship. What am I calling attention to? Listen to me. There was no delay in wanting to be where Jesus was. This man in this text, he exemplifies that. There was no doubt he once was lost, but now he's found. He was not in his right mind, but now he's in his right mind. He ran around those tombs naked, cutting himself with stones. All of a sudden he's in his right mind and he's got clothes on. Where'd he get them? Well, the Bible said, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things should be added unto you. I got news for you. Jesus dressed him. <laughs> and you say, where do you get the clothes? <laughs> well, he just spoke. And... Now, I don't know. It's not in there, but I've read the book. Everything you got on, he spoke into existence. Did he not? Okay. No doubt. No delay. Let's not make the dreadful mistake of overlooking that, which is such a wonderful, worshipful truth in this text. When one has no doubt about his or her lostness and has no doubt whatsoever about his or her salvation, listen to me, there will not be any delay in expressing a new desire to be found always in the presence of Jesus. The story in John chapter 4 illustrates that. The woman at the well... What did she say? Well, after Jesus engaged her and dialogued with her and dealt with her about her sin, all of a sudden the woman said, I perceive that you're a prophet. You see, our fathers worshiped in this mountain. And you say that in Jerusalem, Jesus told her, woman, believe me. The hour cometh when you shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. You worship, you know not what. We know what we worship for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now when the true worshiper shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship Him. God's a spirit. And they that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. And the woman said unto Jesus, listen to this, I know that Messiah comes, which is called Christ. When He's come, He will tell us all things. And then Jesus said, I that speak unto thee am he. Well, when he said that, the disciples came and they marveled that he was talking with a woman, a Samaritan woman at that. And yet not one of them said, what seekest thou or why do you talk with her? The woman then left her water pot. I like this. No doubt. No delay. And she went her way into the city and she said to the men, Come, see a man which told me all things that ever I did. Is not this the Christ? No doubt whose you are, why you are, whose you are, why you stand where you stand as a Christian. Blood bought, sins paid for, spirit indwelt, the temple of the Holy God. That's me. No delay. I want to be where Jesus is. A student at Fruitland I shared with Pastor Bradley yesterday as he took me around the campus of Southeastern. He was a drug addict. I met him at Ministry 7 Homeless Shelter. His name was Robert Learned. He was from up north. Drugs and wild living led him down to Florida and he got halfway back, Hendersonville, North Carolina, homeless, penniless, hooked on drugs and he needed a place to stay. I was at the supervisor of the mission, the rescue mission at that time, and I let him in. While he was there, I took a church, Bat Cave Baptist Church, 1994. A little while later, he shows up at my church. He went into the 90-day program. And he began coming and working and coming back. And one day, I'm giving the invitation and Robert Leonard comes forward and gets saved. Several months later, he enrolled at the Fruitland Baptist Bible Institute. He did excellent. A student went all the way through a two-year program, lived at the mission, got him an apartment. His mother set him up. She was so excited. Something was different in Robert's life. He finished Fruitland with honors. And what did he do? He went on to Southeastern Baptist Theological Seminary. Do you know what one of his first class assignments was? I want you to call somebody, the professor said, and I want you to ask them what is the one thing that's made the greatest difference in their Christian development. So he called Pastor David. I answered the phone. He said, I want you to pray about this, and I don't want it just a flippant answer because I've got to write a paper on it. But what is the one thing that's made the greatest difference in your Christian development? 
And I said, well, you need not wait because I've given this some thought before and I can answer you right now and you can get started on your paper. He said, brother, I'm not in that big a hurry. I said, you probably are. Let me just tell you what it is. And he said, what is it? I said, church attendance. I'm convinced that for me, being where Jesus is, being where Jesus' people are, was the greatest thing that ever happened to me in my early Christian walk. Amen. Do you know one thing? And I say this to you as a man that's been in church since 1988. I've never had a bad day at church. Now, I've had some that were better than others. But I've never had a bad day with God's people. Now, I go a lot of places to preach, and I'm going to be honest with you. I, sometimes, like I'm preaching right here at this wall, I mean, I can feel it. I'm preaching. I don't see nothing but just glare, blank, nothing. That's not the case here. There's a freedom in this church. And those of us that visit other churches would have to agree there's something to be said about that. There was no doubt in this man's mind that he was lost and now he's found. Now there's no delay. You know what he wants to do? Listen to what he wants to do. He wants to be with Jesus. Do you know what he exemplifies? He exemplifies what happened over in Matthew 17 when Jesus took Peter, James, and John on the Mount of Transfiguration and he was transfigured before him. What did Jesus hear? He heard this. Let us build three, three tabernacles. Let us build three places. We can just stay right here with you. And Jesus just looked at him and said, no, no we're going to have to go down. It's in this text too. No doubt, no delay. Look there in verse 19. No deal. No deal. Evangelism, God's way, means no doubt about who you were and who you are now. No delay. You want to be with Jesus. You just like to hang out with Him. People say, oh, if we could just walk with Jesus in the Gospels and sat where He sat and followed Him to the Gethsemane. Let me tell you what we'd have done if we followed Jesus to Gethsemane. We'd have done just like what those that followed Him there done. We'd fall asleep. We'd be no different. Jesus said, if I go away, I'll send the comfort and greater things will you do. What's He saying? He's saying the same thing here. The man says, I want to be with you. So the Bible says, he prayed Jesus to Jesus, begged him, beseeched him that he might be with him. Let me just follow you. How be it, Jesus suffered him not. You're talking to a man that if he had his drethers, he'd still be going to bed tonight in Batcave, North Carolina. Maybe not tonight because I scheduled this back in February. I'd still honor my commitment. But tomorrow night afterwards, I might have to stay the night instead of just going back to Gastonia because from here that's probably four and a half hours maybe I'm just simply saying to you I love that place so much I wanted to stay there but Jesus didn't allow it and in this place Jesus is saying to this new believer no deal what's he saying Jesus said is not this man's my desire is his desire not my desire he wants to be with me I came that man could always be with me so don't understand or misunderstand what Jesus is doing but Jesus is simply saying what he said in John chapter 9 verse 4 I must work the work of him who sent me while it is day for the night is coming when no man can work you know what Jesus is saying though there's no doubt in you you once were lost but now you're found though there's no delay you came right to me. You want to be with me. I want to say to you, there's no deal made. You've got to work. While it's day, I've got labor. There's fruit in that harvest. I need you to go get it for my glory. So he says, no deal. Certainly, certainly, it's his desire that man wants to be with him. But a greater, more needful desire results in Jesus, listen to me, not answering this man's request the way that man wanted it answered. He probably thought, my desire is so great to be with you. Your desire is so great to want me to be with you. You came to me. I didn't come to you. You came to me. I've got to believe with all of my heart this man had within him long before he saw Jesus on the shore of Gadara, of Gadara he had in his heart this desire. I, I need God. Listen to me. No deal. Why? Because God knows best. I told you how I struggled. I told you for six weeks I was disobedient as a man could be in the pastor of a church. God can't bless a church with a disobedient pastor. So there's no doubt, there's no delay, and there's no deal. You can't be with me. There's work to be done. 
Let me give you a fourth truth that I see here. No deviation. Do you know what that means? To depart from an established course. Now I want you to look back in verse 18. Let's read it. And when he was come into the ship, Jesus, he that had been possessed with the devil, prayed him, beseeched him, that he might be with him, howbeit Jesus suffered him not. Now look at this. But said unto him, Go home to thy friends. I love this. And tell them how great things the Lord hath done for thee and hath had compassion on thee. No doubt, no delay, no deal, but no deviation. You know what a lot of people are doing today? Listen to me closely. They're doing evangelism the world's way. They're marketing the gospel. They're entertaining sheep and goats with smoke, mirrors, lights, air conditioning, concert venues, great audio, great video. In other words, everything that a man can do to make seekers more comfortable, they're doing it and I can't find it. I cannot find it, Cody. Now, am I being critical? I'm just being honest. I'm being biblical. People leave churches all the time so that their needs can be met. I got news for you. There's not a church that can meet your need. Only Jesus can meet the need that a human being has. And when we substitute anything or add anything, can I say this to you? He who has everything that this world has to offer and Jesus has no more than he who has Jesus alone. I've been overseas. I've been to third world countries. I've been where people clean themselves with their hands and won't shake your hand because that's how they take care of their business. I know what it is to see people who love Jesus who have nothing. And I've seen people say they love Jesus who had everything the world had to offer and as miserable as any people I've ever seen. So get me, there's no deviation. The way that Jesus is speaking to this new conversion, this new convert, is exactly the way you, you and I need to speak to people today. We can't tell them, come to Christ and your life will be better. That may not prove to be true in their lives. They may come to Christ, God call them to the mission field, they go to Iraq to try to get clean water for the people of Iraq and people ride by and shoot and kill them. Like two of our Southern Baptist missionaries from North Carolina, the Elliots, faced years ago, maybe 12 or 13. I'm simply saying to you, it might be if God calls you and saves you, you might have to die for the cause of Christ. I want to share with you, that might not be a bad deal. There's a Southern Baptist church in California who years ago sent out a girl by the name of Karen Watson. She got saved. And after a period of time studying the Word of God, praying, she couldn't find a mate. God wouldn't provide her a husband. She simply said, you'll be my life. And so God put Iraq on her heart. She was 27 years old. And she looked at her parents and said, I've got to go. They tried their best to talk their daughter out of that, wouldn't you? Because it'd scare you to death to think that your daughter was going to be in a Muslim country in the middle of war-torn Fallujah, Baghdad, Mosul, wherever it would be, a woman, an American woman, beautiful. But she had to obey God and she left. She went over there two different times and came back on furlough twice. Things were ramping up. They thought it was peaceful, but things were ramping up. So she makes and writes this letter and she stuffs this letter into a letter-sized envelope and she hands it to her pastor and it's sealed. And do you know what it said on the envelope? I don't know, pastor, if you'll be here. But if I go over there and if I should by in the providence of God die for Christ on that foreign soil, you open up this envelope at my funeral. About five months later, they got the news. She'd been killed 
by a drive-by shooter. He went into his office and he looked up in his books and he pulled it out. Just a letter. And he took it with him into the pulpit just like I'm sticking it in my suitcase. And he read the scripture and he shared and he talked to the grieving family, friends, church. And then to close his service, his memorial service to Karen Watson, he said five months ago she handed me that and I want her parents to see it. It has not been opened. It's been sealed. I have no idea what it is, but she asked me to share it in the event that she would not come home. So I'm going to honor her request. So he opened it. He pulled it out. He opened it and he read it. Listen to what it says. When God calls, there are no regrets. I tried to share my heart with you all as much as possible. My heart for the nations. You see, I wasn't called to a place. I was called to Him. To obey was my objective. To suffer was expected. His glory my reward. His glory only my reward. The missionary heart cares more than some think is wise, risks more than some think is safe, dreams more than some think is practical, expects more than some think is possible. I was called not to comfort or to success, but I was called to obedience. There is no joy for the Christian outside of knowing Jesus and serving Him. Love, Karen. That was all it said. What am I saying? I'm saying this. She, just like this maniac of Gadara, who was a born again, child of God, converted by faith, who exemplified no delay in his desire to be with Jesus, but Jesus said, no deal. You can't just camp out here. It'd be no different you doing that than some monk going to the top of a mountain in a monastery and just mm, 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 all day long. No. No deal. There can be no deviation. If you're a Christian, you're spirit-filled, you've been given a mandate, and I'm going to say it to this church, 2016 Unity Baptist. If you're not sharing your faith, you have great reason to pray about whether or not you've ever been born again. Now, am I saying take this Bible and jam it down somebody's throat? I certainly am not. And let me give you an illustration as to why I know that won't work. Anybody here ever raised a baby? Take them from the breast to the vinyl-coated spoon? Open up that can of green peas, squash or whatever? Now, I'm going to tell you where most of that bottle, that jar is going to go. It's going to go right on that bib. Am I right? But they're going to get enough to sustain them. But let me tell you now, listen, don't give up. Because if you'll twist the lid off of that banana jar, they'll, they'll chow it up. But even with the banana food, you know what you're going to find out? You're going to find out right quick, Mama, Nana, Granny, Papa, Daddy, you're going to find what? That they will not, you cannot force feed a child when they're through. <laughs> they're through. Am I right? You can't force feed a child of God either. Praise God, I've tried it. I'll preach till 1 o'clock on Sunday sometime just making my point. And I'm God's Spirit will tell me, he said, now, I'm just kidding about 1 o'clock now. But I have gone to 1230. But you know what I've come to find out? Those that were hungry wouldn't leave at 1245. Those that had an appetite for it just asked me. I could have sit here all day. What am I saying? Evangelism God's way means no doubt who you were, whose you are. No delay. I want to be with Jesus, don't you? Oh, glorious day. Can you imagine what that's going to be? Huh? Somebody said when I got saved, I was just out there, man. They said, roll him in. My pastor, you don't have to roll him in. I'm 58 years old, but I'm a young 58. I'm ready to see the Lord. And I'm more excited about having a relationship and seeing him face to face than I've ever been in my life. I'm going to see Jesus one day, Jack. Hey, Jack. Hey, I'm going to see the Lord Jesus one day. That man that we read about in the Bible, that we pray to, that we sing to, I'm going to see him. You are too, son. 
When you come to faith in Christ and the Spirit of God lives in you, you're going to have that same confidence. That boy's sicker than me. He's heard every word I say. I'm telling you before God, Adrian. You listen to me, Adrian. I'm going to see the Lord that spoke this world into existence. I'm going to see Him one day. But until that day, there's no deviation. There's only one way men can be saved. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Amen? It's Tuesday night and I'm feeling it. Woo! No deviation. You can't depart from an established course. Jesus has but one way to save, and that's to tell people what He's done for you. That's a testimony. And then tell them what He can do for them. That's a witness. There's a guy coming over here to the office today. <laughs> he knocked on the door. Your pastor went to the door. I sat in the other room and just listened. He's trying to give a vacuum cleaner presentation. We've all had those knocks. But you know what your pastor did? And I grinned from ear to ear. He took that whole conversation, talking about cleaning. <laughs> and he took that True Life card, Unity Baptist Church, and on the back got that video. And he began to share with that man. I'm telling you, the best way I've ever seen anybody quit a cold call like that is to share Jesus. <laughs> now, Harold, he threw you under the bus, brother. You're going to get an email. <laughs> and all it is, you can just follow up on what Bradley did. It might even be you let him give the presentation so you can give yours. Mormons knock on my door all the time. I, I commend them. I live in a parsonage right next to a church. <laughs> and they still knock on my door. And I said, I'll do one thing for you if you'll do one thing for me. I'll listen to what you got to say. But promise me you'll listen to what i got to say. And invariably they'll say, are you the pastor of this church? <laughs> See ya. <laughs> I'm just simply, there's no deviation. Rick Warren's church out in Saddleback, I love him. He's a man of God. I love Rick Warren. But I'm going to tell you what they did, and I, it's a mistake. They took down the cross, and anywhere you come up, if you go to Saddleback, even if you come into the foyer, you're not going to see the cross. You know why? Because the leadership team, years ago, now they might have put it back. I just... They took it down. They just don't want to have it as an offense until they get an opportunity. Can I just simply say this to you? Sooner or later, you're going to have to tell them what all this is about. Huh? The cross is an offense. But Jesus never told the Jews, well, you're not going to have to come this way. You must be born again, Nicodemus. No doubt, no delay, no deal, no deviation, no disobedience. I love what it says. Look at the text. I'm just, man, I'm walking right through a piece of Scripture. I'm, look at Jesus said to him, Go home to your friends, tell them how great things the Lord hath done for thee, and hath compassion on thee. And he departed. Three words. <laughs> you know, Nike made millions on three words. Nike, the shoe company. Somebody tell me what three words that they made millions on. Say it again. Do you know that's what Mary said to those people at that wedding in Cana? Did you know that, Cody? You thought about that, did you? You know what she said to those guys about that water and that wine? She said, whatever he says to you, just do it. Just do it. <laughs> We're complicating this thing. Since I've been saved, I tell people about my Savior. Not because I got to, not even because I'm a preacher. I'm going to be honest with you. Most times you see me at Bat Cave. Now, Gastonia's a little more sophisticated. At Bat Cave, I'd have on blue jeans, brogans, and probably three or four Sundays out of a week, I'd have on a fire department t shirt because it's much easier to respond to an emergency when you don't have to rip your clothes off and put on a t shirt. So I'd be in my office dressed for a fire call because anytime the tones can go off, that's a pretty good lesson for every Christian, right? When that tone goes off spiritually, you ought to go. Right, Lonnie? Huh? What's it? Marines, you're ready. Prepared. Equipped. Trained. Just get the call. You don't ask why. You go where they say go, right? You're still a Marine, aren't you? Absolutely. Always be a Marine, won't you? Come on, church. One of the biggest regrets in my life is I signed up to go in the Army and my whole family went sideways. We made the paper. I couldn't go as oldest of six kids. And the recruiter read about me, my, my family, in the paper. And I went to see my recruiter to sign. I was going into the army. I wanted to be an MP. I wanted to be a soldier. And you know what that recruiter said? You won't hear many of them say it. He said to me, it might not be the time for you, David. And he pulled out the paper and showed me what he had read. Front page of the Gastonia Gazette. Talking about my family. A big fight. So I listened to the man. I respected him. 
And in time I got a job, took care of my wife, my four brothers, my wife, my mama, my four brothers, and my little sister. Now my stepfather and my mother are reconciled sometime later, but by that time I, I just kept working. And I've never served in the military. But there's not a Christian in America that loves the military more than me. And I'm just about to turn the NFL off because of what O'Collins done and what others are doing. I'm just telling you, that's the way I feel about it. If you feel different, pray about it. Pray for me. But it just actually sickens me that men and women have given their life so that I can be a Christian, that I can preach the gospel. And people make a statement. He's got a right to protest, but it's just not right time, right way, right place. I'm just telling you. No deviation. No disobedience. And he departed. Where'd he go? He went right where Jesus told him to go. I say to you right now that when Jesus tells you to do something, you need to do it. That's why I'm the pastor at Grace Baptist Church. So he goes home to his family and friends. He was in no doubt whatsoever that his life had been changed. And hey, listen to me. When he got home, hey, think about it, Cody. When he got home, guess who else didn't have no doubt? Guess who else didn't have any delay? Guess who else was told there's no dealing with God. You're going to do it his way. He won't deviate in the least. What happened, Daddy? What what happened, brother? He told them what happened. Jesus came to me. When I could not go to him, he came to me. I think I might write a song. No, I think it's already been written. He came to me. Listen to me. It's evident when you really meet Jesus. My daughter told my wife after I got saved, can you see it, Mama? Mama said, see what, Heather? Can you see it? He really did get saved. I did. I ain't had a headache one from no hangover in 29 years. You listen to this preacher. There's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. They saw it. No doubt, no delay, no deal, no deal making, no deviation. There's one way faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God, and no disobedience. Whatsoever He saith unto you to do, just do it. Let me give you number six. No dilution. No dilution. In other words, to dilute means to make something weaker, more palatable. <laughs> Take your crosses down. That's not necessary. Take them down. Get them in here first. Give them coffee and a sweet roll. Get them in here. Make sure the temperature's right. Get rid of them old wooden pre pews. You know, there's enough. I love these. These are great. We have them in our church. But there was a time when people came where there was no heat or air conditioning and there was just a wood plank. Can I tell you? And the Holy Ghost of God came down. Charles Spurgeon got saved in a building like that. All I'm simply saying is, listen to me, we should be everything we should be for the glory of God, but I'm going to tell you, do not dilute the message. There was no dilution. What did it say? And he began, and he departed, verse 20, and began to publish in Decapolis, that was the region of about 10 cities, towns, villages, if you will. It's a big metropolitan area. Listen, how great things Jesus had done for him. People said, I can't preach. I got news for you. There's female preachers. I'm going to say it again. There's female preachers. I say pastors. Every child of God is a preacher. A witness. What did this man do? <laughs> he went and shared what Jesus had done. Can you imagine people in that area that are Catholics? Now, I'm sure they might have heard of him or someone like him. But here he's going. He's giving his whole stories. You know where I used to live in a cemetery? Do you know what I used to do? I'd run around naked up there and I was chained. But the chains couldn't hold me. Demons had me. I'd break them chains. Nobody could tame me. People were afraid to come to where I was. I was one bad dude. But I was always thinking, as mean as I was, as bad as I was, as hopeless as I was, I had this thought in my mind because, listen, we were created in the image of God. There's this void in the human heart that God put there that makes us desire Him. Can you agree with that? There's something there. Romans 1 said those that won't come to Him are suppressing the truth and unrighteousness. They're holding it back. They know there's a God. 
atheist. The only people God called fool in the Word of God. The fool saith in his heart, there's no God. They know there's a God. They just don't want to submit themselves to Him. So they stick their hands up and their fists up and they make profane signs to God. And God sits in heaven and laughs. You listen to me. Don't delude it. He went back. He told the whole truth about what had happened. About his past. About his present. About his predicament. About his promise. About the Lord's power. About the Lord's purpose. About his own privilege. He just started talking about, I once was lost in sin, but Jesus took me in and a little, little light from heaven flooded my soul. He paid my heart in love. Wrote my name above. Just a little talk with Jesus made me whole. No delusion. And you, I want you to look and I close. And all men did marvel. No disappointment. <laughs> no doubt, no delay. Jesus said, no deal. You can't just hang out with me. You've got to go. Don't deviate from the truth. Tell them that I've sent you. Tell them what I tell you to tell them. Don't disobey me. No disobedience allowed. And do not dilute the truth. Give them the whole truth and nothing but the truth. So help you God. And if you do that, you will surely not be Disappointed. I want every Christian in here to look at me and just give me just this moment. If you're a Christian, no matter what you've been through, how long you've been a Christian, are you disappointed with Jesus? Never. Do you know what I've given you tonight from that story? And you can search the Scriptures for yourself to see if it's true. That's what the children of Issachar did in the Old Testament. That's what the Bereans did in the book of Acts. They, they just searched the Scripture to see what the man was saying was true. So you search the Scripture. I'm giving you the paradigm, if you will, the blueprint of our Lord Jesus Christ when He was on this earth. He had no doubt as to whose He was, who He is, and what He was about on this earth, no doubt at all. There was no delay. Do you know that when He gave up the ghost on the cross, that that was an ordained time? But in the fullness of time, God sent forth His Son made of a woman, made in the likeness of men, that He might die for man. There was no deal. You remember when He prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane? What did He do? Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Then he said, what, sister? Nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. No deal. No deviation. I cannot depart from the established course. He came to die. He told them. No disobedience. You know what he said in John chapter 8, verse 28, 29? I do always those things that please the Father. That verse years ago gripped my heart. He's the only man that's ever done that. I do always those things that please the Father. I do some things. I'd like to be able to say I do most things. But to say that I do all things always to please the Father, not me, not you. But Jesus, no disobedience. No dilution. Nicodemus, you know all about the law. But I'm saying to you, don't try to, don't try to make light of it. Don't try to, you can't enter into your mother's womb a second time. I'm not going there. I'm not going to have that foolish discussion with you. Man must be born of water and of the Spirit. You must be born again. People laugh at Baptist. Why even the greatest, the biggest, I say greatest, let me, the biggest church in Buncombe County 
in Asheville, North Carolina, the Biltmore Baptist Church, who's had the hand of God on it for a couple of few decades. I'm serious. As long as I've been in back age, God's done wonderful work there. You know what they did just here recently? They took Baptist out of their name. Why? I'm going to tell you why. Now, I'm going to go ahead and give it to you. This is my presumption, but I'm going to tell you why. Because their attendance is starting to go down, and all that Baptist name in Asheville just don't appeal to people. So it's just Biltmore. Biltmore. They want you to come to Biltmore. Now, now be careful. If you Google that, you might wind up at the shopping center. Or you might wind up at the Biltmore Estate. And it's probably highly likely you might go to the Biltmore Winery Vineyard. Just Google Biltmore and see what you get. In time, you'll probably get built more church. But let me say this to you. I knew a man who pastored down here in Wilmington. Eugene Ridley was his name. He pastored the Longleaf Baptist Church, and he refused to take Baptist out of it because people said, we need to take Baptist down. People, that just gives a sour taste in people's mouth. We're just known for our fights. Do you know what he said? <laughs> we need to keep Baptist in it because people need to know what we believe. And Longleaf is just a pine tree. So we're not just a pine tree church. We got something we believe. Unity Baptist Church, thank God I know what you believe. Now some churches have Baptists on there and they don't even believe what their name says. They probably should take it off the sign. Holy Roller Social Club, something like that. But I'm simply saying no, no deviation. Jesus lived it. He was the truth. And can I say this to you? He finished. No disappointment. The Father in heaven was pleased with the Son. Is He going to be pleased with you and me? How important is it? Evangelism. Tell me, preacher. It's 828. My goodness, I'm just enjoying this too much. Bill O'Reilly got shorted tonight, didn't he? It's this important. It was March the 16th, 2013, a Saturday. 11.45 in the morning. Sunny day. No wind blowing at all. I had a boy with me at that time. He had been with me for 16 months. His name was Tristan Dakota Simpson. Twelve and a half years old. Foster child. Level 2 therapeutic. When he came to my house 16 months previous, he was as mean as a rattlesnake that had been made mad. In time, through discipline and love and correction and reward, he became respectful. One night he lied to my wife and to myself. And because we caught him in a lie, we knew we caught him in a lie, the punishment for that evening was no television. So he took his shower, and he was in that shower for, I know, 30 minutes. And he never took those kind of long showers. Pretty soon the shower was off, the door was open, the light was turned off, and he stood in the bathroom door crying. While he was taking the shower, the Holy Spirit of God convicted him of his sin. Standing in there, he said, Can I speak to you, David Marlene, Pastor David Marlene? I said, Yes, sir. Would you cut the television off? And I said, Yes, sir, and I cut off the news. He walked in front of me. My wife came out of the kitchen and sat down. He said, I lied and I won't admit it. And he started crying. I said, well, I appreciate you saying that, Tristan. But the punishment stands. There will be no television tonight. He said, I don't want to watch it. But I want you to know, Pastor David, that as I was taking a shower, God told me I was a liar. God told me I was a sinner. And God told me that all you ever wanted to do was to help me. And God told me I needed to be saved. I said, Tristan. And right there in my living room, he got on his knees before me, the pastor of the church, his foster dad, for 16 months. And he said, pray for me, Pastor David. And I did. And he prayed, and he gave his heart to Jesus. Three weeks later, I spoke to his mother. They were strange. She was a drug addict. I spoke to his social worker, and everybody on his child care team says, if he wants to be baptized, that's between him and God. And I baptized him. The Batcave Baptist Church was just praising God. I led him to Jesus and baptized him. About four months later, March the 16th, 2013, 
2013. At 11.45, we rounded Highway 64 at the Rusty Bucket. It's a little business plaza. And as I started up the road, I could see a tree at about a 45 degree angle there. And it fell right against my truck and on my winch and just slammed. I slammed and that tree exploded and he screamed. I was taking him to his grandpa for a day of shopping. He screamed and, Preacher David, Preacher David, we about got killed. And he was crying and screaming. And man, I was scared. I said, calm down, son. I grabbed him. That tree, the dust, the limbs were just everywhere in the front of my truck. I had a heavy truck. It just hit the winch and hit my great big steel bracket there. And just, so I got my fire radio and I started to key the mic. 2106 to Central. And about the time I did that, a black Ford Escape came out from underneath that tree. Two, three miles an hour at most. The whole top of that brand new Ford Escape was inside the passenger compartment. Front seat, back seat, just flattened like a pancake. Tristan screamed and cried, Oh God, they're dead, they're dead, they're dead, Bridger David. I said, Come here, boy. And I held him and I said, 2106 to Central, MVA, Rusty Bucket, Highway 64, tree versus car, possible pinion. Then I hung up. Then I followed that vehicle 805 feet, the state patrol said, straight down Highway 64 heading east, didn't go over the double yellow line, didn't go over the white line. And all of a sudden, 805 feet later, it curved off, went down into uh, Camp Judea, went in between two before, four befores holding Camp Judea sign. I mean, it just went right between them, didn't touch either one, and hit a tree. Three miles an hour top speed. I said, son, you sit right here. 2106 to Central, out to investigate. They were all coming. I started hearing the sirens. Traffic was slowing down. Some people that saw the tree, the road was blocked. And I went around that car. I made him stay up in my truck. And I looked in there and she was gone. She was gone. It was horrific. What I saw was horrific. 2106 to Central. Confirmed fatality, one occupant. Everybody routine. So I left there. And they all came. As I was walking up to that boy, he come out of the car and he run up to me and he hugged me, big boy. He was crying and I was crying. He said, they're dead. I said, it's just a lady, son, one lady. And yes, son, she's dead. Pastor David, Pastor David, I said, what? Thank you for telling me about Jesus. Thank you, Pastor David, for leading me to Jesus and baptizing me. And he started crying. He said, because today, me and you just about went to heaven together. I needed to hear that. Let's pray. The woman's name was Anita Rhodes Chapman. 48, 49 years old. She just had breakfast with her husband at the Mustang Cafe. They kissed goodbye. He went home to jog she went by Walmart to buy a new outfits for her precious grandbabies too. Her daughter-in-law was having twins just in two months. Girls, they said. Inside the back of her car, I saw the little outfits. I saw the Walmart bag. But she wasn't there. How important is evangelism God's way? Well, it's the difference between heaven and hell. Will you stand as we close this service, heads bowed, eyes closed? I don't know what the invitation...